Um, okay, um, thank you for sticking around uh, to listen to me, given that I am not a fashion academic or an academic of any kind at all. Um, but I am an enthusiast um, who thinks way too much about consumption in general. So when Nancy told me she was giving this course, uh, I got very excited. Um, my blog, um, which is called Bin Oracle, is about uh, ways to resist mass consumption and finding value in rubbish or things that other people uh, no longer want. Um, so, yeah, thanks uh, for trusting me with your students, Nancy. Um, so, um, I know this lecture is about fast fashion, but I think to get a handle on what people mean by the term fast fashion, um, which Nancy, I think, is going to be going into much more detail later, um, I think you need to look a bit at the history of Western fashion through different lenses, um, be they economic, labour, or um, societal, or technical, technological. Um, um, I think it's very easy as consumers to conceive of fashion as a force of nature, as something that just springs organically uh, into our shops, uh, our TV screens, magazines, and wardrobes. Um, and that kind of reading of fashion detaches it from things like business, labour and social mores. Uh, and it's this detachment, I think, that allows fast fashion to thrive. Because um, it's precisely um, what happens when you're not thinking about the huge sort of multinational companies uh, paying a pittance to labourers in the developing world, um, that magazines will print more editorial so that we go out and buy more clothes uh, and they sell us more clothes and so on in a, a cycle. So first lens um, I think we should look through is class. Um, once upon a time, before the mid 20th century roughly, uh, fashion was a very different beast. Uh, as a concept, fashion and fashionability uh, in the sense of tra changing trends, only applied to members of the elite. Um, for centuries in class-based societies, only the very rich um, could afford the sort of ostentatious display of wealth that came uh, in the form of expensive, uh, delicate, uh, often imported fabrics like silk, lace, muslin, um, along with pearls, gold, jewels, fur and feathers. Um, uh, the concept of changing your style of costume was reserved only for the elite, um, most people, for most of Western civilization, um, had a maximum of about two outfits, one to work in six days a week, and one to go to church in after their weekly bath on a Sunday. Um, and those clothes would just last until they fell completely apart. Um, they'd be mended over and over. This, you know, They'd be made of durable fabrics, but um, and so they would last for years and years and years. Uh, and then when they did fall apart, you would make it into a kid's, uh, kid's outfit from smaller pieces that you can salvage. Um, in a scene from Calico Captive, uh, a novel set in 1754 in colonial North America, um, it, it shows very, very poor people actually unravelling um, sweaters, like jumpers that they've knitted, to be re-knit into a larger size for their children who have grown over the year. Um, uh, in households <laughs> like the one depicted in Downton Abbey, um, the female servants uh, would be given as a Christmas present a bolt of fabric uh, with which they were allowed to make their next year's uniform, which I kind of think is like uh, a modern equivalent would be like getting a Christmas bonus from your boss and then being told, oh, and you have to buy your next year's your, your new computer from that uh, bonus. I think it's pretty much the most passive aggressive Christmas present you could ever get. Um, so meanwhile, um, better off women would have a new set of clothes for every season of the year uh, to conform with the latest trips. Uh, it was all about being seen at parties and balls and in the latest fashion which is not so very different from today, except that that's a perfect way of limiting class mobility. Um, in 1868's Little Women, some of you might have read, uh, Meg and Jo March, whose once middle class family uh, had been reduced to respectable poverty, are invited to a genteel party, but 
they almost can't go because, huge dilemma, they only, they have two pairs of gloves, but one of their gloves, one of the pairs of gloves is soiled, it's dirty, they can't clean it. Um, and they, so they don't have enough gloves to go around for each of them to wear a full pair of clean gloves. Their solution is to each wear a clean glove and carry the, one of the soiled pair in their hand, which is considered to be an acceptable compromise. I don't know why. Um, and, and it seems ridiculous to us, but it's an excellent example of the way that fashion once acted as a social gatekeeper. Um, so with all this in mind, it makes a lot of sense then that um, peasants uh, wore more or less the same kind of thing in terms of how they looked for centuries. Um, so just for an example, we see here, these are both from the 1570s, um, and you can see the, um, the one on the left, that's the left, um, is, you know, obviously from the sort of Shakespearean Elizabethan era, um, you know, it's got the rough, it's got the, the gold stuff, all the beads, uh, and the peasant on the right is um, much plainer. But then compare that to this set of clothes from 1810, we see the fashionable one uh, on the left is completely different style, look, uh, adorned in a completely different way, it's much simpler, um, much less corsetry, no rough. Um, but the peasant outfit, on the right is kind of not not that dissimilar to to this one. Um, so despite 250 intervening years, um, we see that the sort of peasant classes don't get a whole lot of change in their um, in their outfits. Okay, so another lens we should look through fashion through is gender. Um, can I take a quick survey? Um, can anyone just yell out a guess? How long do we think? people have been wearing white wedding dresses. How many centuries? How many years? Any guess? Anyone know? Just yell it out. Four hundred years. Sorry? Four hundred years. Four hundred years, okay. Four hundred years. Any advance on four hundred years? Okay, four hundred years. Uh, you would be very wrong. White wedding gowns, despite what we think of them as being oh, traditional and uh, oh, people have always done it that way, they've only been popular since 1840, um, when Queen Victoria wore white to her wedding, uh, and it caught on as a display of ostentatious wealth because it demonstrates that you can afford a dress that wouldn't be worn for any kind of physical labour that can be very easily uh, damaged or you know spilt or spoiled on. Um, it's also a mark of the sort of gendered nature of fashion. Um, so while there have been plenty of fashion changes for men. Um, the basic form of sort of trousers, jacket, uh, shirt stays roughly the same for a good couple of hundred years. Whereas women, as wives or daughters, are primary or primary vehicles uh, to denote men's wealth, along with their other possessions like houses, carriages, uh, land, and servants, and so on. Um, so it's also essential to note, in a fashion capacity, that women's role in capitalist society is primarily that of the consumer. Um, and popular narratives of, say, women's insatiable and supposedly innate desire for clothes prop up the industry that behind, behind uh, our fashion choices. Um, and also, it's very important to remember that for women, um, clothing was, and does remain to a certain extent, deeply connected with issues of morality. So like, how much cleavage are you showing? Are you showing ankle? How much skin? Are you wearing a hat? Are you wearing gloves? All this kind of thing, and that has changed over the centuries, but there's no such um, correlation for what men wear. Uh, so, another lens is uh, labour, and if we're talking about women's role in fashion, I think it's also worthwhile talking about women's role in the production of clothes. Um, so, because obviously, for most of the clothes wearing parts of human history, clothing has been handmade for individuals and usually by women. Poor men made clothes for rich men, while poor women made clothes for rich women, poor men, children and themselves. Um, fabric production is also typically hand-loomed, again usually by women, um, 
but that has given way to mechanically made uh, and therefore um, faster and cheaper fabrics. Um, as you can see, this is a this is an image from a a cotton mill in the during the industrial era. Um, uh, now, the labour of pr producing clothes is still mainly carried out by poor women. Um, but of course, they're sort of hidden away in the developing world. Um, meanwhile, of course, the intellectual labour of sort of fashion design is carried out in the West. Um, so what changed? Um, this is, <laughs> you see, 1814 to 2014. Um, and I sort of think, well, I look at that and I say, well, there's not a whole heap of difference between, say, 1814 and 1914, but in the intervening century. A fair bit has changed. We've got lots of different silhouettes, a lot more skin on show, different kinds of fabrics, different kinds of patterns, uh, and just a whole different way of conceiving sort of feminine fashionability. Um, so, yeah, you've probably noted while I've been talking that things are quite different these days. Um, from the look of the clothes to how they're produced and how, when, and why they're worn. Um, so what happened to change the status quo? Um, I think it's a combination of things, most of them with no intended effect on fashion. For instance, um, <coughs> the invention of the cotton gin in 1793 uh, is the machine that quickly separates cotton fibres from their seeds, um, which ultimately, um, well, one of, the un one of the other unintended outcomes of this invention was uh, the American Civil War, which you can read up in, in your own time. Uh, but another corollary was, of course, quicker processing and eventually cheaper cotton, um, which was also helped along by the Industrial Revolution, which was roughly 1760 to 1840. Uh, so cheap cotton meant a departure from the more durable fibres like wool and calico, which were um, favoured by the working class in their dress, um, and therefore more disposable fabrics became, began to become more popular and widespread. Uh, an increase in literacy uh, and a concurrent uh, rise of magazines throughout the latter 19th century um, oops, no, not yet. Um, also set the scene for the advertising of fashion uh, and of course the introduction of photography towards the late 19th century and throughout the 20th century also cemented that. Um, and fashion advertising also sort of exploded in the uh, 1980s when um, you had a, a lot of um, sort of very shocking ad campaigns. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, um, World War II is another factor. Uh, so, so um, major austerity in terms of fashion because fabric was rationed. So um, things that people wore had to be a lot slimmed down from what they previously were, and much plainer. Um, so, and the entry after the war of Christian Dior, whose uh, 1947 new book, which you can see on the left there, was a direct response to that austerity, um, with the sort of voluminous skirts and much more luxurious fabrics. Um, and that also helped to cement the concept of the designer label, um, sporting hundreds of cheaper brands in the 1950s. Um, at a similar time, second wave feminism began to catch on, uh, and the result was that there were more women in the workplace, and many fewer women at home making clothes uh, for themselves and their families. Um, throughout the 60s and 70s, ready-to-wear clothes became the norm where once they were the exception. Um, tech uh, technology in fibres also advanced, um, creating fabrics like nylon, rayon, spandex, viscose, cheap but durable and able to be formed into the sort of new shapes um, to fit the changing social mores, which we can see an example of on the right there, it's from the 60s. Um, so, all these threads came together, sorry, no pun intended, um, to produce the fashion climate we have today. We're far from seasons referring to summer, autumn, winter and spring, we now have producers like Zara and H&M, H&M, sorry, using very cheap labour uh, to and fast supply chains uh, to create up to two mini seasons per week. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is in stark contrast to the days of colonial Australia, uh, when fashions were sometimes up to a year late due to the fact that they had to wait for the styles to be sent out on the boat uh, and then you know, the next season to arrive. Um, Uh, this is supported by a very fast-moving media as well, that makes us believe that clothes are not for life, they are just for Christmas. Um, they're not made for life, uh, to last, sorry, but it doesn't matter because there's always more on the way. And to come back to my point about detachment that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, the detachment of the product and the consumer, um, I think it's interesting to note that in, kind of ironically, in uh, liberating women from their sort of role in the house, um, we're making clothes for the family, they have been disconnected from the production of clothing and therefore become sort of reliant on capitalist structures for their clothing instead of their own skills and ingenuity of making their own. Uh, and meanwhile, the range of expression available to men through dress has sort of expanded exponentially, um, possibly also in response to more traditional patriarchal values. Um, is class still a factor? Oops, no. Uh, certainly, although it's substantially more fluid and much less defined, uh, I think it's also it's noticeable in the fact that um, the sort of this is I think this is a thing that happens more in the UK where I've been um, living the last few years. But um, it's sort of really, really cheap, very, very affordable clothes for women are often quite sexualised, um, and they're often made from sort of very flimsy fabric. So far from one or two items of clothing, today's working classes have masses of clothing, but they're forced by the lack of durability to constantly be bumming more. Um, and we're sort of inundated by shiny things to spend that cash on. Um, is it a bad thing? Maybe not by itself, but it is uh, environmentally unsound. Cotton, for instance, has a huge water consumption rate, and the worldwide supply chain that chain, sorry, that sees zips produced in China, buttons sourced from South America and all being brought together to Cambodia to be produced before being shipped to the West um, leaves a huge carbon footprint. Um, the ethics of fast fashion are at best questionable and at worst dehumanising and unethical. Um, and yet we still privilege new and fashionable clothes for their ostentatious display of wealth and taste. Um, oh, and that was... Um, I'll get to that later. Um, so I think that any system that can simultaneously support uh, that, this, so this image on the left, which is American Apparel, uh, ad from March, um, which plays on their sort of fa famously sweatshop free, um, and all made in America. Um, and yet, it, it's sort of, it's referring to the Rana Plaza disaster as the picture on the right. Um, so I think, any system that supports both of those things at the same time needs a lot of thinking about. Um, we should be questioning the sources and ethics of our fashion in the same way we question our free-range eggs, for instance. Um, and as with any rapidly changing market, uh, its ethics, production values, environmental impact and economics should always be uh, under scrutiny. Thanks, guys.